Hello everyone, welcome to the session Kubernetes on AWS Zero to Hero. Very happy to have you all here listening in and let's get started. Um, yeah. So what, before every session, I kind of try to, to go through a bit of the, what are the learning goals and what are the main things that, that everyone will be learning from this session to, to kind of uh, do some a bit of expectation management as well. So as the name of the session, we're going to learn about Kubernetes in the cloud, particularly about AWS. And the session is a zero to hero session. So we will, I won't, well, I will start relatively from the zero. Uh, I will go quickly through with one slide on what's Kubernetes and, and whatnot. But essentially, um, the session is best suited for a person who maybe has decided that, okay, they want to get started using Kubernetes and, and on AWS, and they don't know exactly what service to start with, what are the kind of tips and tricks, how to go from there, but there should be maybe some basic knowledge of container technology already at hand. Uh, I won't kind of start with the, the immediate, immediate basics, but quite along the lines there. Um, and also this is an AWS specific session, but a lot of these learnings are applicable to other cloud providers as well. So um, no need to worry if, if, if you are fearing that you're only one area that you're mastering. Actually, a lot of these things are very um, Kubernetes specific rather than um, cloud provider specific or so, or the setup or the, the organizational structure is similar in other cloud providers as well. But today's topic is on AWS and that's nice. Um, so, and I won't be going through kind of like, uh, I will have some step-by-step -step things, but not essentially much. I won't focus on that. I've created this session to serve as a kind of jumping point for, for you to get um, familiar with these techs. Uh, tech um, stack and so forth. So then, um, then you can, for example, on your own time, go through the installation step by step and, and start, for example, deploying your first cluster and so forth. But this session serves more of a kind of quick start on how to get started with uh, with a few things as well. So that's that's the learning goal and the expectation management for this session particularly. So uh, before we jump into the content itself. Uh, who am I and why am I speaking to you about all of these things? So um, I'm Annie. I'm a senior product marketing manager at Camunda, uh, a process automation company. Um, I'm also a CNCF ambassador as well as an Azure MVP. But really what this all means is that I'm very passionate about the cloud as well as the Kubernetes and cloud native tech. I'm also a Kubernetes and CNCF meetup co-organizer as well as a startup coach. I coach early stage startups. And I also have a cloud, I have a cloud podcast called Cloud Gossip uh, that you can find at cloudgossip.net. Yeah, but that's it about me. So let's then jump right into the content. Um, so just super briefly before we get to the kind of zero to hero part, uh, what is Kubernetes if you are unfamiliar or you need a refresher? So this is straight from the Kubernetes documentation. So this is the official Kubernetes answer to the question, what is Kubernetes? So Kubernetes is a portable, extensible open source platform for managing containerized workflows and services that facilitates both declarative configuration and automation. So what this all means in, in, in a kind of very uh, nutshell and a really, really easy way. So as where in the traditional deployment you had the hardware, then you had the operating system, and then you had the apps on top of it. If you move to the um, virtualized deployment, you have actually the hardware operating system hypervisor, and then you switch it to the, the app bin library operating system and the virtual machine, and these are all inside a virtual machine. But then if you move on to the container deployment, you add another layer of container there as well, which means that you get to the even more towards this kind of microservices architecture and so forth. So that's what Kubernetes is and that's the historical context for why container management is such a big thing nowadays as well. A bit, very brief look at this. So uh, then let's jump on to, if you're wondering, okay, what is Kubernetes, you know what Kubernetes is, you know what AWS is, you know, major cloud provider and so forth. You might be wondering, okay, which uh, of the Kubernetes services or like which ways to deploy Kubernetes into AWS should I be using or should I be looking into? Like what fits me and what doesn't? 
So no worries, I will be taking you through a few considerations and, and services that you can use to use Kubernetes on AWS, which uh, I'll be going through Amazon EKS, AWS ECS, and AWS Fargate today. Uh, EKS and A AKS are very similar in this sense. If you are familiar with Azure World, for example, um, and so forth, but e Amazon EKS and ECS and AWS Firecade are the ones that we will be looking into these things. Um, so what is EKS? Um, and here is some kind of pros and, and cons in here. So EKS is a service that provides and manages Kubernetes control plane on its own. So you have no access to the master nodes on EKS since they're under a special AWS account. So to run a Kubernetes workflow, EKS established the control plane and Kubernetes API on your managed AWS infrastructure and you're good to go. And um, at this point, you can also deploy workloads using native Kubernetes tools like kubectl, Kubernetes dashboard Helm and Terraform and so forth. Um, so there are some advantages and, and challenges to EKS. So the pros are really there, so no need to install, operate, and maintain your own Kubernetes control plane. It easily runs Kubernetes tooling and plugins, automates load distribution and parallel processing really well. It has easy migration of Kubernetes assets, smooth migration, and supports easy to spot instances as well. And the challenges are deployment requires expert configuration, or at least you need to know what you're doing. It's not the simplest service to use, and you, p you should pick it if you're handled to um, you know, manage Kubernetes it's, uh, itself already as well. Uh, but from from my perspective of, of a kind of Kubernetes and cloud native, excited, uh, enthusiastic, um, one of the main things is really great um, about EKS is that it supports Kubernetes tooling and plugins. Um, so for example, you can take um, advantage of the whole open source ecosystem around Kubernetes to supercharge your Kubernetes clusters and, and deployments so that you can kind of get to the next level as well. So that's, uh, from my perspective, really nice because then you can get to a very good experience relatively fast. Um, and then AWS Elastic Container Service, so ECS. So um, you can use it uh, a bit of a different ways as well. So AWS ECS stands for AWS Elastic Container Service. It's a scalable container orchestration platform by AWS. Uh, it was designed to run, stop, and manage containers in a cluster. The containers themselves are defined here part, as part of a task definitions and driven by ECS in the cloud. So you can use ECS with EC2 instances, which is best for long running tasks, or AWS Fargate, good for serverless tasks. So if we look at the bit that there's two options, so with EC2 instances, the, the pros are full control over your instance types. You can use spot instances as well. And cons, you're responsible for security patches, network security and instance scalability. So, and then with AWS Fargate, which is then goes to the serverless world, um, the pro is that it's serverless, AWS takes care of availability and scalability, and Fargate spot for spot instances. The cons are that it supports only one networking mode, which is AWS VPC as well. Um, yeah, and then it's just a bit of a closer look towards AWS Fargate as well. So what is AWS Fargate then? Um, usually container management platform um, reworks the server CPU and memory to allocate them to your workloads better, but the underlying server is still there. So just divide it in a different way and it might become a burden in managing your system. So AWS solves this problem with Fargate by taking over the management of the underlying server and instead of doing all of the tasks yourself from booting the server and installing the agent to making sure that it's up to date, you can simply create a cluster and add your workload to it. So AWS will add pre-configured servers to the pool automatically to support your requirements. Um, um, and surprisingly, actually 32% of AWS container environments run on Fargate today or nowadays. So uh, some considerations to, to think about it is that it's not good fit for highly regulated environments where companies use dedicated tenancy hosting. And the combination of ECS and Fargate supports only one networking mode, which is the AWS uh, VPC that comes with limitations if you need to have a deep control over the networking layer as well. Yeah. As well, yeah. Uh, and then kind of uh, looking into the similarities um, closer with AWS EKS and ECS here as well. Um, so they both have a 
layer of abstraction. So EKS and ECS come with a layer of abstraction for containers called deployments in EKS and tasks in ECS. And their functionalities are quite similar, but they will both have a cluster, a combination of all the working components. They allow a mix of AWS compute platforms. So whether you are running things, your containers with ECS or an EKS, you can choose one or more AWS compute options from EC2 instances, AWS Fargate, AWS Outpost, AWS Local Zones, AWS Wavelength, and so forth. And you don't need to monitor or operate them. So these managed services eliminate the effort in operating services uh, and allow your team to focus on core applications, which is really great. And you can easily assume that they will be reliable and highly available at all times. And the Kubernetes control plane API will be up and running no matter what, even when updating the latest release as well. And they do share an approach to security as well. So to access the service and resources securely, AWS provides the identity access management IAM solution, which is the same here as well. So now that we looked a bit about the similarities, well, what are the differences then? So pricing is, a, is, is one of them. So in general, if you run ECS and EKS clusters on EC2 instances, you'll be pay, paying the compute cost that depend on the instance types you pick and its running time. Um, ECS doesn't come with any additional charges, but EKS does. So um, there's a bit of an extra charge there, um, which might not seem a lot in the beginning, but the cost might add up quickly, obviously, if depending on your setup as well. Uh, and then deployment, you can set up both EKS and ECS from the AWS management control, but then things start looking a bit different. So EZS is really simple to deploy. After all, it was designed to be a simple API for creating containerized workloads without any complex abstractions. And you get no control plane, no. So once your cluster is set up, you can configure and deploy tasks directly from the AWS management control console. So deploying clusters on EKS is a bit more complex and requires expert configuration. And you need to configure and deploy pods via Kubernetes first because EKS is just another layer for creating Kubernetes clusters on AWS. Uh, you can speed things up a bit, and I will give a tip on that later on, but it is it, it's a bit more complicated on AWS, on EKS, than, than other ones available. Uh, you have multi-cloud pro probability as well, portability. The ideal scenario is that when you can move your workloads from one cloud provider to another with minimum disruption, if you're interested in that. Um, and while ECS is an AWS proprietary technology, EKS is based on Kubernetes, which is open source. So uh, Kubernetes in EKS allows you to package your containers and move them to another platform quickly if you need to. So EZS has a more of a vendor lock-in side of it. Um, and then uh, the second to last on this list is networking. So when using ECS, uh, you use AWS VPC network that receives an elastic network interface attached to the container instance hosting it. You will be looking at default limits to the number of network interfaces that can be attached to an EC2 instance, and the primary network interface counts as one. So, so just to give you an idea, um, a C5 large instance may have up to four NIIs attached to it by default. Um, yeah, so in EC2S, the maximum number of NIIs can assign various states by AC2 types. Even though AWS increased the limits, this might not be enough to support all the containers you want running on this particular instance as well. Um, with EKS, you can assign a dedicated network interface to pod to improve security. All of the containers inside that pod will share an internal network and public IP. And you can share an NII between multiple pods, which allow you to place more pods per instance. And fifth, which is what I mentioned as, as a big point to me as well, so community support. So the open source Kubernetes rules are proprietary easiest, rule over the proprietary easiest, in, in my opinion, particularly as well. Uh, and the latter offers limited community assistance, so you can only count on the corporate support of AWS. So you get uh, you know, community support, Stack Overflow, GitHub issues, resources from official training to online courses, community maintained tools like kubectl extensions, Helm charts, bit more on that and Kubernetes operators and much more. I will be taking you through two um, services that you can actually use uh, if you're using EKS a bit later on as well. So when to choose, uh, you choose EKS when you need a granular control over container placement, when you need more networking modes and when you want more control over tooling. And ECS when your DevOps service resources are limited, when you don't have time to for resources to pick and choose add-ons and when Kubernetes is just too much to kind of handle on, on go.
Mm. So you might be already <laughs> noticing the trend that that as a as a kind of um, person who um, was really um, interested in it and ex excited about Kubernetes, my solution usually is to go with EKS on my side, uh, and really the kind of the freedom that you have with uh, with the open source Kubernetes community and tooling that you can use, I think EKS is definitely worth it as well. Uh, and I will show you a few applications later on that you can use to enhance your EKS and Kubernetes experience as well. But before we go in there, just a quick info into how to create a cluster in EKS. So um, we will be going, I will take you through the steps and then gonna show you kind of an easier way and a uh, shortcut in the end. So set up our preparation steps are create an AWS account, free tier works fine. Um, and then you get to use AWS CLI as well. Create a VPC, so virtual private space in AWS where you can do your own stuff as well. Create an IAM role with the security group uh, and security IAM role is to create essentially an AWS user and security group is just, you know, that with permissions, that what permissions does the, does the, um, does the user or their group have. So step two, create a cluster control plane. Uh, so this is created with the IAM role and choose cluster name, Kubernetes version, choose region and VPS for your cluster, set security for your cluster. Uh, step three, the last step, create worker nodes and connect to cluster. Uh, create uh, create as a node group, a group of nodes, choose cluster it will attach to, define security group, select instance site, resources, define max and min number of nodes. So this is all of it combined. And I do have to say that even though AWS is a wonderful, wonderful cloud provider, this is a bit more complicated than with other um, cloud providers, for example. So this is why there is an easier way to manage these things as well. Um, so it is relatively complex to, to, to use, but no worries. There is a, we works to the rescue. So there's a way to simplify this, which is using EKS CTL. So it is. it was created originally by WeWorks um, and it kind of creates a basic cluster in minute which is just with one, just one command, EKS, CTL, create cluster. So it's really powerful, really easy to use, essentially kind of a zero to hero trick that you can use um, to go a bit faster. So the cluster will be created with the default parameters. So it will have a very nice auto-generated name um, two M5 large worker nodes, and this instance type suits most common use cases, and it's a really good value for money. And it uses the official AWS EKS MI. It will go to US West 2 region, and it has a dedicated VPC as well. Um, uh, so you can customize your cluster by using a config file as well. So it is really great way to, to cut a few steps away from here and, and get to the things faster. And now, if you're looking to then further on, after you have created your cluster or you have all up and running and you then you want to, you know, start using those great open source tooling that really kind of takes your Kubernetes usage to the next level and your EKS usage to the next level. Um, I'm going to take a look here now uh, closer to uh, to Helm and Linkerd, which is our really great kind of beginner. Well, not they are <laughs> beginner in the sense of using user friendly because they are very they're open source projects that are very far along in their journey. So they are graduated CNCF projects. So CNCF is the Cloud Native Computing Foundation, which is home to Kubernetes, as well as Helm and Linkerd, which means that they are graduated, which means that they are fully recommended for production. There's a lot of good documentation, guides, um, knowledge, good communities around them so that you can get the help you need if you have any issues running in uh, these things. So that's why these are maybe really great zero to hero tooling to use as well, because you can get a lot out of these things, but it's also relatively easy to get started with these two as well. So kicking off with Helm, um, and essentially as an example of how to use Kubernetes effectively. Um, and then, so what is Helm, you might be wondering. So Helm is a package manager for Kubernetes. It's essentially kind of like Homebrew, Snap, or Chocolaty for Kubernetes. Um, and I think if you are unfamiliar with package management, one of the Helm maintainers really put it really well. It's tooling that enables someone who has a knowledge of an application and a platform to package up an application so that someone else who has neither extensive knowledge of the application or the way that it needs to run on the platform so that they can use it. So this is really the power of package management and the power of Helm as well. So what are then the benefits of Helm? 
It helps you manage complexity. It has easy updates. It has simple sharing and rollbacks. So what does this mean? So um, the charge uh, in the Manex complexity phase, they can they describe even the most complex apps, provide repeatable application installation and serve as a single point of authority. And easy updates, you know, just make um, updates easy with in-place upgrades and custom hooks. And charts are easy to version share and host on public or private servers. And with rollbacks, you can use Helm to roll back to an older version of a release with ease. So what are then the principles of Helm? So Helm takes security very seriously. As I mentioned previously as well, it is rel it's very, grad uh, very mature, very graduated project. So it has multiple maintainers, multiple companies backing it. It has power user email list, release candidates, all the good one, good things. It supports Mac, Linux, Linux and Windows, and it's passed 1 million downloads a month already in 2019. So it's been a household name for a while. Um, yeah. Then if you're wondering how Helm is used, it's used by charts. And the prerequisites are to have a Kubernetes cluster, deciding what security configuration to, to apply to your installation, if any and then installing and configuring Helm. Um, and then I have a quick Helm demo here today. So and it is easily deploy a complex application, in this case WordPress, to Kubernetes using a Helm chart. So you can really see how easy it's to use these services uh, when you have the uh, right uh, tooling, so to say. Uh, then let's jump to here to get my demo notes because that's always needed i have the that already there so if we do kubectl get services we then here we see that yes we have a kubernetes cluster running there it's an empty one so that we know that i am not cheating on this demo and it's all kind of starting from scratch so then uh, if we do kubectl get services all namespaces that oh we see actually that there's a lot of linkerd stuff inside of here but that's mostly because I have another demo, which is the Linkerd demo. So no worries here. So then if we do, actually, let's move this up a bit so that I can see a bit better. So if we do Helm list, then we see that no, there's no Helm releases either. So we are truly starting from scratch. And then if I was doing this for the first time, I would do Helm repo at Bitnami, and then I can do it, but it's gonna just say that, you know, I've already done this step um, because where would we now adding the Bitnami there, but I have it already. So then we do Helm search repo WordPress, which is gonna show what Helm releases we have available. Um, First, uh, the machine starts to run slow anytime you try to do a <laughs> demo. So then um, we see that there is, let me let's do it that fast because it might take a while. But so, so then we see that we have the Bitnami one and then we have the stable WordPress available as well. But the Bitnami is updated and newer. So we wanna go with that one for sure. And now when I did that command, which was kubectl, uh, Helm install, actually Helm install Bitnami WordPress generate name. We are actually then starting the magic. So we're getting that WordPress site started. So now it's all gonna be generating there, but then we can actually use the, the kubectl get services, the same command that we used before uh, to see that, yes, now we have an external IP ready that we can start using already as well. Uh, it's probably not gonna be up and running quite yet. I have a lot of terminals ready for the future as well, but we can put it here to safety. Well, not safety, but uh, so that we were already copy pasted it there. It's gonna take a couple minutes for it to run, uh, to, to sprung up, but no worries. We have things to do while we wait for that. So while we are getting that, you know, we do also wanna get using our cube uh, to our Helm, our WordPress, because the thing is that um, you know, we don't we just want to look at the WordPress. We want to actually, you know, log in with our credentials, start using the service, start writing our blog or whatever we want to do with the WordPress. So then to get the admin credentials, you see the username there, which is user. And then we're going to copy paste this here. And then we see the, the password to the WordPress here. So then we are waiting for this one to, to sprung up as well. 
um, but it's gonna usually takes it's gonna be ready really soon if demo effect doesn't get me today so what have we done within this demo overall we've installed the wordpress and mariadb track kubernetes cluster configured wordpress and stored the admin credentials securely as kubernetes secrets so we did quite a lot of things in a very short amount of time and now it sprung up there perfectly we have the hello world working and then if we do uh, admin here we can get to actually trying out our password if we did it correctly it should all work all nice and smoothly perfect it's looking like it does yes no issues whatsoever there so we're very happy to see this working so we see the welcome to wordpress we could do a quick draft and da 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 so forth so we did install a really complex application mariadb2 and mariadb2 our uh, kubernetes cluster configured wordpress and stored the admin credentials securely as kubernetes secrets i have to say it all happened quite fast so with these kind of things you can really kind of make the most out of your kubernetes service as well so let's get back to our slide deck in the meanwhile so then um, we're gonna jump into the next slide and to talk about the next cncf project that you can leverage to kind of use kubernetes even more effectively that you could do out of the box so that is linkerd so how to use effectively is to use a service mess which is in this case i'm going to do an example of linkerd so linkerd is a service mess it's a recently graduated um, cncf project it's a ultra light ultra fast security first service mesh for kubernetes and the goal, overall goal is to reduce the mental head overhead of having a service mesh to begin with. So what does Linkerd do? It provides observability, service level important metrics such as success rate, latencies, and reliability, retries, timeouts, and security. So what are then the benefits kind of continued? Well, uh, Linkerd has a really thriving open source community. It's very, uh, very welcoming. Highly recommend getting joined there. It has a very simple and minimalist design, so no complex APIs or configuration needed. It has deep runtime diagnostics, so you can get a comprehensive suite of diagnostic tools, including automatic service dependency maps and live traffic samples and so forth. It's very light and very fast, so it's built in Rust and Linkerd's data plane proxies are very small and very fast. It installs in seconds in with zero configurations, as mentioned before, that's the goal of Linkerd, it's to be very kind of simple to use. And it also has those actionable service metrics. So best in class observability allows you to monitor the golden metrics, success rates, request volume, and latency for every service as well. Um, so continued there, the principles are that it just works out of the box. That's the main goal. Uh, it's light, it's the lightest service mesh around. It's simple to reduce operational complexity. It's very security first. So security is a default, not an extra, and it has its own proxy. It's not using Envoy, which is another CNCF project. Uh, the, uh, the, um, the, um, the own proxy is built specifically for Linkerd and it's called Linkerd2 and it makes this foundation more secure and custom as well. So what is needed to use Linkerd? It's injecting this and that's it. So that's simple, very easy. So then we have a really quick demo on easy real-time service metrics from uh, about Linkerd as well. So then if we hop on over to another terminal, because I have open here just ready for our demo and then we're gonna get our linkerd demo notes um, oh, the machine is always so slow when you need it to be fast then let's do this and then we're gonna do get to see here to see the app that we are working with uh, there we go. So the app, the, the Linkerd demo app, thank you to the Linkerd team, by the way, for this, uh, it's emoji vote. So you see here a lot of emojis and uh, we can vote on them. So we can vote for the funky uh, face here. We can pick another one. We can vote for the mask one, pick another one. We want to vote for the monkey one. And then if we click view the leaderboard, we actually see that, oh, there's quite a lot more um, votes than that we just gave. So we know that there is something happening as well. So there's a lot of bots voting in this emoji voting ad uh, as well. So we can actually have 
a bit of visibility into what's happening on there if we go to here and then we put this one here linkerd top d and uh, then we see here all the bots voting it's uh, happening uh, constantly there on the background and then if we actually want a bit of a more graphical representation of all of these things so you can have multiple commands that you can use within the terminal as well but in the interest of time we're going to now skip straight to the linkerd dashboard um, and it's going to open up here in another browser perfect so we're going to drag it here to show it there we go working very slow but we are making it through so here we go in here we see uh, success rates latency and so forth and if we want to see some of the same info we could go to tab and top to see some of the info that i showed there but then if we want to see even more kind of graphical interface we can actually click here um, and we can see the prometheus even more info and this is all very easy to use very light to start using so we can now here start to see even more we can see global success rate request volume la 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 success rates latency and so forth so you get a lot of info already from the get-go so you can you uh, using a service mesh is definitely really great and helps you to manage things better so perfect so then let's now jump back to the slides as well after we saw how easy it's to use linkerd super quick so these were all um, services that you can use to to really supercharge your eks um, use so if you're using eks on aws to run your kubernetes you can use these kind of open source tooling to really take your kubernetes use to the next level so with helm you can get the the benefits of package management and link linkerd you get all of them the many benefits that i was speaking to you before as far as the recommendations for next steps goes obviously we don't have time to cover these everything today but you know you gotta look into security reliability scaling cost optimization networking service uh, cost optimization and so forth and service risk we, we did run through quickly here but obviously do a bit of a deep dive there as well and definitely a long list, uh, but that's where um, the expertise in EKS management comes in or our AWS management comes in for sure as well. So yeah, as a wrap up, uh, we went through EKS versus ECS versus Fargate. We went through EKS overview. We went through how to create a cluster on EKS as well as an easier way to do it with the ECS CTL create cluster command. Then we went through Helm, we went through Linkerd, demos on both. And then there was a few recommendations for next steps, but we went over that very fast. Uh, but no worries, here is learn more resources. So Casti has a really great um, EKS versus ECS versus Fargate uh, blog post as well. Um, so you can highly really recommend checking that out if you want to kind of recap the knowledge that I, that I read through here, uh, that I went through here. And then um, you can go to a idea of like EKS best practices. This has a really great, a lot of good best practices. So the previous slide that I sh showed you, you can actually start kind of going through step by step there to learn more about them. You can take a check out the easy tool at ekscl.io. If you are more new to Kubernetes topics, uh, you, I recommend checking Tech World with Nana. They have in a lot of great content in YouTube as well as CNCF YouTube, which has a lot of great resources. The KubeCon North America sessions will be hitting it, um, have, have been available for now a while, or like a few weeks, not a while maybe. So highly recommend checking those out. And as always, I'll add my links and slides to my GitHub page so you can check them out there as well. Um, so that, uh, thank you from my side. Thank you for having me to the event organizers. Thank you for listening to me. Really great to be talking to you about the, the topic important to me, which is Kubernetes and cloud native tech. Um, if you have any questions, you can always reach out to me on Twitter, as well as, of course, um, just if you want, you can follow me to find out more about Kubernetes and cloud native topics in general. Uh, very happy to have spoken to you today. Uh, and let's chat more in Twitter if there's any questions that you have. Thank you.